Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. From darkness to light, this is the story we all share as the people of God. He draws us out to draw us in. From the birth of Israel to the church today, God delivers and dwells with his people. This story began several thousand years ago, and it began with a promise from God to Abraham that he would make his offspring more numerous than the stars in the sky, a great nation who would one day dwell in the promised land. More than 400 years passed, and Abraham's descendants had not seen this promise fulfilled. Instead, the Israelites lived as foreigners in the land of Egypt. Fearing that the Hebrews would grow into a mighty nation and overtake them, the Pharaoh of Egypt forced them to work as slaves. But Israel continued to grow. In response, the Egyptians increased their oppression of God's people and Pharaoh gave a terrible decree. Every son born to the Hebrews would be thrown into the river. But a Levite couple defied this order, trusting God's will for their son's life. And God did have a plan for this child. Pharaoh's daughter found the baby and took pity on him. She named him Moses because he was drawn out of the water. As Moses grew older and saw the suffering of his people, anger burned within him. When he witnessed an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, Moses killed the man and fled Egypt to hide in the desert. Years passed, and Moses made a new life for himself in Midian. Then one day the voice of the Lord called out to him from a burning bush. God told Moses that he saw the persecution of his people in Egypt, and he heard their cries. He promised to deliver the Israelites from slavery and he commanded Moses to go before Pharaoh on their behalf. Moses was terrified, so God sent Moses' brother Aaron to go with him. The brothers went before Pharaoh, performing signs and wonders, but Pharaoh would not listen, so God brought down plagues upon Egypt. Yet Pharaoh's heart remained hard as stone. To prepare for the tenth and final plague, the Hebrews marked their doors with the blood of spotless lambs. That night, the angel of death passed through the kingdom, killing the firstborn child of every Egyptian household that did not bear the mark, including Pharaoh's. Heartbroken, Pharaoh told the Israelites to go. They were finally set free, and the Spirit of God led the people out and toward the Promised Land. But Pharaoh's grief soon turned to rage. He changed his mind and then commanded the Egyptian army to pursue them. When the Israelites came to the Red Sea, Moses lifted his staff to the sky and the waters parted. The Hebrews passed through the towering waves and the Egyptians were swallowed by the sea. The Israelites found themselves in a harsh wilderness. Though they had just witnessed God's power and might in rescuing them, the people doubted their deliverer would provide and instead complained of hunger and thirst. A few days later, they found manna on the ground, sweet and good to eat. And the Lord told Moses to strike a rock with his staff, giving them water to drink. The Lord had provided yet again. As the Israelites approached Mount Sinai, Moses delivered a word from God 
If they obeyed and kept God's covenant, God would make them his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the people promised to do so. Three days later, the mountain shook as a sound like a trumpet grew louder and louder. Then the Lord came down in fire and smoke. When the people heard God's voice, they grew afraid, and they asked Moses to speak with God on their behalf. God gave Moses many laws and instructions, including the Ten Commandments. And the Hebrews promised to worship the Lord alone and to keep his laws. Moses spent 40 days and nights on the mountain with God and returned to find the people bowing down to an idol. They had forgotten their promise. Moses burned the idols and atoned for the people's sin. And though God punished the Israelites, he did not destroy them completely. After the Israelites repented of their unfaithfulness, they went to work making everything that the Lord had instructed. They sewed fine garments for Aaron and his sons and consecrated them with oil for their service as priests. They built the Ark of the Covenant to hold the tablets of the law and also built the tabernacle where God would dwell with his people, Yahweh, the one who drew them out of slavery. And though the Israelites would endure more strife and hardship, they continued on in hope toward the promised land. The story of Israel is the story of us today. We are God's people. He draws us out to draw us in. And like the Israelites, we still await the promised land in the midst of our sin and suffering. Yet God is with us. Good morning. I was joking with our staff last night after we kind of walked through the sound check that it's hard to come out after that because I feel like I'm entering in to a scene after we've just shown the final scene of Braveheart, where it's really epic, and then I walk out and it's like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> here we go, let's just do this, <laughs> let's go, let's go do, I feel the need for us to go and do something right now, uh, but instead we're going to dive in together. Uh, hey, I'm excited to be with you this morning. If you missed the welcome, my name is Trevor Joy, I'm one of the pastors and elders here, and I'm excited to dive in God's Word and continue on in our study of Exodus this morning. And if you'll allow me, kind of how I want to set the table for our time this morning and our story, the specific part of the narrative that we're gonna be at in Exodus, I wanna share kind of my own story to give us context for what we're gonna be diving into today. So a couple years ago, Michael and I were asked to, to go to a conference in England. It was a church planning conference um, to kind of really see how the village can be involved in church planning around the world. And so we were excited, said, yes, we'd love to go. And so we began to make travel plans for that. And if, if you don't know me, uh, then I'll let you in a little bit about me. I don't like to fly. So if I'm gonna be really honest, I hate to fly. Um, I get really anxious about flying. The thought, even just mentioning flying as I'm talking to you gets me kind of anxious just thinking about it. Um, and if I have the opportunity to pick another mode of transportation, I'll do it. I'll say, hey, let's, I'm the guy that's like, hey, let's go on a long road trip. Let's do that. Let's, uh, but unfortunately, going to England, I wasn't left with a plethora of options. It's board a plane, the whole boat thing, I don't think is still a thing. Um, and so plane was what, that was our choice. So we made our travel plans. And the, the idea was to leave on a Sunday evening, fly overnight, and get there the next morning so that you can sleep on the plane, be rested, and be there in the morning ready to go. That's the idea. So Michael and I go, we're with a group, we board the plane. It's a really, really big plane, it's a new plane, I did a lot of research on it, it's a real safe plane, had good reviews. <laughs> I was a little nervous, it was a two engine plane, not a four engine plane, but those engines, two engines, were like the size of most you know, small aircraft's whole shell, so they were big engines, I felt good about it. It was a big plane, our seats were in good spot, we were at the bulkhead, so it was, my, myself, Michael's right here, the bulkhead walls in front of us with our little screens in front of us, and those screens, pretty much their sole purpose is to tell you the time temperature and then chart your flight path. So that's sitting right in front of us. And then of course the exit doors on our right and our left. And so they come in, they give, we give them our verbal yes, we're good to open up those doors should anything happen. They don't know who they're asking in that. I said yes, Michael will for sure put my oxygen mask on and open those doors should anything happen. Because I will be rendered useless. But I'm gonna answer yes, because I'm a man and I don't, in pride, don't want to let you in on what's going on inside me right now. So we kind of taxi out to the runway, the plane takes off, it's a big plane. Uh, what I hate about flying 
are takeoffs. I hate takeoffs because there's just a bunch of weird noises that happen. Every plane's a little bit different. And I know, I, I hear all of them every time, and I recognize that's the landing gear. I recognize that's the wing or whatever. Or we're getting through the clouds. I get it every time. Everybody tells me it doesn't matter. When I'm in the moment, there are weird, wrong noises. But what's nice about a big plane is you just, you were kind of camouflaged from that. You really didn't hear those noises. So we're, we're taking off, smooth takeoff. We get up to cruising altitude. Captain comes on and says, hey, we're, you know, we're kind of at this altitude for our time. This is going to be our flight time. I'm like, great. Okay. Settled in. I feel good. We're doing this. It's going well. Okay. All right. I'm settled. And then they come around and they, you know, they give us our menus from dinner. It's like you can have chicken wrap or chicken wrap. And then we kind of make our selection. We eat dinner. They come back around. They kind of take our plates. Go. And then they come around and start doing the, the, the routine to get everybody settled for the night. So they are passing out blankets and pillows. They're you know, asking if you want another drink before the end of the night or whatever and begin to turn the lights off. And so right as this is happening, uh, the plane starts to experience the one thing I hate more than takeoffs, and that's turbulence. I hate turbulence. Turbulence to me is a product of something going wrong. It's not a product of just the natural environment. I, I get it. Don't send me the email. I've talked to pilots. I understand what you're logically going to respond to. In that moment, it does not matter. What computes in my mind and heart is something's wrong. So turbulence begins, and I'm starting to get anxious, right? And they're kind of, everybody's getting in the moment where they're starting to calm down. And this turbulence is moving, and I'm going to describe this turbulence in two ways. It was persistent and ever-creasing in intensity. That's the turbulence was. And there was a group flying with us, and I've asked them since then. And so if you're thinking, I'm just kind of responding out of my own fear or whatever, I'm exaggerating. No, they have concurred. This turbulence was persistent and ever-creasing in intensity. And so as they're going around and getting everybody kind of settled in, tucked in for the night, I'm just sitting there. They come and give me the blanket and pillow, and I'm not even thinking about that. I'm just literally, all I'm thinking about is this plane shaking, and it's not stopping, and it's, and it's ever-creasing in intensity. And everybody else is getting ready to go to bed, and I'm going, well, no. So here's the scene. Let me just invite you into this, my little personal nightmare. Michael is sitting next to me. He breaks out his neck pillow and his blankie, and he rolls over and goes sound asleep. They shut off the lights and pass out the headphones, and everybody's either watching a movie or sleeping, relaxed and calm. And I'm just sitting there with nothing but my pillow and blanket in my lap, sweating, staring at my new friend for the next eight hours, which is the screen that's going to tell me how long it's going to take to get there. And the plane is continuing to shake. And so I'm just kind of alone staring at the screen. And as the turbulence persists and continues to grow in intensity, (laughs) something else happens and that the plane begins to venture. I'm watching the flight path and plane begins to venture and the land that we were over begins to just kind of disappear. And then I don't know if you know how the screens work. It does kind of two things in rotating fashion. It zooms in to show the plane big and what's around and then zooms out. Well, at that moment, the zoom in, zoom out thing ceased to matter because all that was around the plane was dark black ocean. And then everything that was going on in me just kind of picked up a couple of notches. The turbulence continues to go, and now we kind of got a new little thing the turbulence is doing where the plane's just kind of doing that, you know? (laughs) Kind of dropping a little bit, kind of turning like that. It's kind of where you're not, you know, you're not setting your drink on the on the table, you're holding it. It's that kind of turbulence. I'm not again, I'm not exaggerating. There's people that can verify this. And so I just want to paint the scene for you. I'm sitting here alone in a dark cabin. Michael's just sound peacefully asleep next to me. Everybody else is doing their thing. Lights are off. Flight attendant's nowhere to be found. Pilot's not coming on and saying, hey, this is what's going on. He's not addressing the obvious that this is really bad. And I'm just sitting here alone, sweating, staring at a screen that there's no land. There's nothing for us to do. So I begin in that moment kind of starting to think, what are we going to do? So I start computing all those things in my mind. So I'm thinking, well, we're over here. Maybe Iceland's close. Maybe we can do an emergency landing there. If if this gets real bad, if it gets worse, can we ditch it in the ocean? Is that little brochure in front of us true that this plane floats? You're laughing. That's what I'm computing in that moment. I kind of entered into a new stratosphere of anxiety and fear. And I just kind of get to the end of myself. I mean, I'm drying my hands off. I'm doing everything I can. And I just can't shake it. I can't get out of it. And so the only thing I know to do is I just wake up Michael. Misery loves company. And I was like, hey, hey, Michael, wake up. And he's like, hey, man, what's going on? Something's wrong. And he goes, what do you mean something's wrong? I go, do you feel this turbulence? He's like, yeah, it's turbulence. It's okay. And I said, no, 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 I don't think you understand. It's really, really bad. Something's wrong. It's been going this entire time. It has not stopped. Like usually the pilot kind of goes and finds smooth air and then turbulence stops. 
it's been persistent and ever increasing in intensity. <laughs> and so I'm telling Michael, hey, something's wrong. He goes, no, man, it's okay. It's turbulence. Look, nobody else is freaking out. It's okay. Just try and go to sleep, watch a movie, distract yourself, whatever the pilots have it. It's okay. I don't, Michael, I don't think you understand. Something is wrong. What are we going to do? And then real quick, abruptly, he turns and looks at me and he says, what do you mean, what are we going to do? <laughs> and in that moment, I recognized <laughs> this conversation needs to stop. <laughs> this is not going to go anywhere helpful. You just need to go back to sleep. I'll handle this. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, whatever. He goes back to sleep. And then for the next six hours, pretty much the, the, the turbulence persisted until we saw Ireland kind of pop up on the screen. And I know that because, again, I was there with my little friend, the screen, just shaking. And so what I was experiencing that entire time while he slept, and I, I think we got to England, and I went to bed. I mean, I was like, you guys go have fun. I got to sleep because I did not sleep in the entire flight. Bloodshot eyes. The whole time, I'm just sitting there in this cycle of fear and worry my response to fear and worry is I want more control. And when I realize I don't have the control, I, want, I fear more and it creates more worry and anxiety. And that's the cycle over and over I was experiencing again in that moment. And so if I can invite us to kind of pop up from that and look at that scene just from above, being able to see what's going on, what you see are two very, very different responses to a shared reality. And the reality that Michael and I shared in that moment is that neither one of us were in control, Right? Michael's response to not being in control was trust. The pilots have it. Man, they know what they're doing. I can trust in that. That's fine. They, I can be at peace. They have it. So that gave him freedom. he roll over and go to sleep. My response in that moment was not trust. It was fear. Pilots don't have it. I'm about to have to go and take the handle and do this. <laughs> that fear produced a need for control, Right? Michael was grateful that he didn't have control. I grumbled, right? I reviled. So it's interesting, as, as we get to peer into this portion of our Exodus narrative tonight, we get to kind of peer in from that bird's eye view of what's going on with the people of Israel. And we know, as we've talked about with this Exodus series, that one of the main overarching themes that we're t that's continuing to persist throughout this series is that God's way is better than our way, but it's different than our way, right? And so what we get to peer into in this part of the Exodus narrative is we get to see God's people's response when they're confronted with the reality that God's way is different than their way, when they're confronted with the reality that they're not in control. And their response is not gratitude. It's not joy. It's fear. It's grumbling. So let's, let's dive in this together. I kind of want to paint the picture a little bit of what's been going on because since God has rescued his people from slavery, he's been consistently testing his people. And we see this several places in chapter 14 alone. I'll just list them out for you. Um, he takes them in odd directions without telling them why. He surprises them with deadly attacks from their enemies after being delivered from slavery. He has them walk through an ocean. He takes them on a geographic route where they are going to lack the necessities they need to survive. And then right before this, right before 16, in the end of second half of 15, his people run out of water. They run out of water. And then the only last water source they find is essentially contaminated. So the context of our story today is a people that had been rescued out of generational slavery under the reign and rule of an oppressive pharaoh. They were miraculous, miraculously rescued. Not just in that they were rescued and delivered, but in how they were rescued and delivered. There was no doubt that what God's people had experienced up to this point was nothing short of supernatural. They had every reason to believe that it was God that was doing this. He had not hidden his hands from the rescuing of his people. Israel had been rescued from slavery. They had been brought through an ocean. And then every day they were being guided by a pillar of cloud to remind them in a supernatural way, it's God who is guiding them. So in these chapters of Exodus, we see two back-to-back -back tests of Israel in 16 and 17 because it's important for God's people to learn faith amidst struggle. In each of these accounts, we're gonna see God people responding in a way that Dr. Aiken calls functional atheism. They're responding in a way where they choose to be uh, under fear, the control of fear and anxiety versus trusting in a sovereign God who's going to do what he said he was going to do. So they choose to believe in their lack of control versus a God who is in complete control. 
These tests were a part of God's sovereign plan to teach his covenant people how to trust and follow him. So when we get to this place in the story of Exodus 16 17, the people at Israel have been traveling for about a month now and they enter in to the wilderness, which is a geographic region that is vast and rugged and harsh. A commentator, Philip Ryken, talks about the wilderness this way. He said, if being delivered out of slavery was about Egypt's salvation, or about Israel's salvation, their time in the wilderness was about their sanctification. And this is the place in God's testing where we're gonna pick up the story today. So in chapter 16, uh, is gonna be referenced back to a lot in the Bible. This story, what we're about to step into today, is gonna be referenced back a lot. So as the people are traveling through a region that is sparse of resources, is rugged and vast, Quickly, as you can imagine, they ran out of food, right? And food not being readily available because of the place that they're in, you can imagine these are, these are people, these are families all together in mass moving together and they run out of food. So all of a sudden, this moment becomes grave. It becomes life or death. And what is their response? There were, now, what we, we kind of see what we think the response should be in that moment, because again, if you're, if you're to pop up and you're to look back at a bird's eye view of all that Israel has come through, all the people of God have experienced that God has supernaturally delivered them out of the hands of Egypt. He supernaturally brought them out. He has supernaturally provided in every single way. These people had no uh, reason to believe that God would not show up in this moment and solve this problem too. But instead of responding in faith, they chose to respond in fear. Let's pick this up in verse one. We'll read together how they responded. It says, they set out from Elim and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The ungrateful response of the people of Israel in a time of testing was not faith, it was fear. It was not trust, it was control. He said, we'd wish you'd rather left us in slavery or at least we had plenty of food than to bring us out into this wilderness only to kill us by starvation. This would become the, will become the consistent refrain of God's people when they walk in disobedience to the Lord. Oh, how quickly we forget our chains. Because remember, any provision of food under the hand of the Pharaoh was not for their flourishing. It was for their enslavement. Yet they would rather return to a life of bondage than endure this trial in front of them. So let me kind of paint this picture this way. Have you ever seen those moments where you've got some friends that have little kids and you're in some sort of public situation maybe out in the foyer, maybe at a restaurant, and one of the parents' young kids decides he's just gonna jump off into a full-out tantrum, and he's starting to get loud, and you know the parents are kind of dealing with two things in that moment. First, they're trying to deal with their disobedient child that they need to correct and kind of squelch this little mini rebellion that's happening. The other secondary thing that's happening is they're feeling judged by every other parent around them because their kid is the one that's being loud and obnoxious in that moment. So everybody's, this is one of those situations where everybody kind of dials in because this is obvious what's happening. And then, just to take up a notch, that kid, as he digs his heels in and is in a full-on tantrum, does something just utterly disrespectful and disobedient and embarrassing to that parent. Like, let's just say, a kick in the shin, slap to the face, or yells something really loud and obnoxious at them. And in that moment, everybody around them is now zeroed in on what's happening. Everybody's dialed into this and everybody's thinking the same thing. Is this kid about to get a whooping? <laughs> but that's the vantage point that we have as we look at this part of the story. People of Israel had every reason to believe that God would sh supernaturally show up and provide here too. He had been the whole time and he promised he would. They had experienced his provision in every way, shape or form. They had every reason in this moment that he would. And the fact that they chose to revile is absurd. And fully expecting God to respond to his disobedient children in wrath, he doesn't. He responds in mercy. Let's look at this in verse four. It said, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. 
So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. They named this bread, this provision, manna, because they literally didn't know what to call it. And in these next verses to follow, God's gonna give his people specific instructions of how they are to go about gathering this provision. And I love how Douglas Stewart describes these instructions. He says it this way, these instructions given by the Lord were not so that he could see if Israel could follow directions, but if their hearts were inclined to be his covenant people. Because the question God is asking here is will you follow me when my way differs from yours? This story is an important benchmark in the life of God's people. It's gonna be referenced back to over and over again throughout the Old and New Testament. Manna is going to become an important symbol for God's provision for his people. So I kinda wanna dial in here and I wanna talk about manna and and describe it really in two ways. I wanna describe manna as satisfying and manna as sanctifying. So first, let's talk about manna as satisfying. So in these instructions the Lord gives to his people, he says you're gonna go out every day and you're gonna gather a portion, one omer, one portion, which is exactly what one person needed is all they needed. He said, you gather just enough, not too much. And on top of that, he kind of put some guardrails up where he says, at, at the end of every day, whatever bread is left over, either result of the fact that you didn't trust me and you gathered too much, or if you ate to the fill and you were satisfied and there was some left over, whatever bread was left over at the end of the day would rot before the next day. Why? Because he wanted them to go out the next day and trust that manna would be there waiting for them, that he would provide. And again, they would get up and they would gather another portion of what they needed for that day. Because God in that moment is trying to teach his people a new way of understanding provision, that they would have to trust him every day. Now, from our vantage point, that, that seems pretty easy, seems pretty clear, but if we, if we dive down to the ground level of these people where they're at, this is an agrarian society. His way of provision would be antithetical to their understanding of provision. Why? Because in a grain society, when, when the crops are ready to go out and harvest, you go out and you harvest all the crops. You pull them in and you store up and you make those crops last for the rest of the seasons when food isn't gonna grow. Why? Because crops don't grow new every day, right? You go out and you gather those crops and you store them up and then you hope that you've grown enough to then be able to last and provide out through the rest of the season when the crops aren't gonna grow. But God's saying, no, you're gonna go out and gather just enough for today. And then tomorrow, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna trust me that there's gonna be enough for you waiting there and the next day and the next day. Because the test God is putting before his people is that the struggle in trusting in the sovereign grace of God is the struggle between fear and faith. This is that functional atheism we've been talking about. Are, we going to, are they going to believe in the God behind the promises? Or are they gonna believe that their way is better? That they're gonna to have to take care of it? That it's up to them? As Charles Spurgeon Spurgeon says, when we can't see his hands, we can trust his heart. And what God is teaching his people, when you can't see into tomorrow, when you can't see the man in my hands will lay down, you can trust my heart, that I love you, I've got you, and I'll be there too. And for 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness, God provides every day exactly what his children need to flourish. Because God's provision is not about our success, it's about our flourishing. God wasn't teaching his people to succeed when times get tough. He was teaching his people what it means to flourish under his leadership. Success is wrapped up in our ability to accomplish something. It's about achieving a certain aim. Flourishing is about growing healthy in an intentional environment. We want to achieve and succeed because it's wrapped up in our ability to do. But God is teaching his people that he desires them to flourish and grow healthy through what he provides. Because ultimately, Everything we can do and muster will leave us wanting at some level. It's God's provision that satisfies. Manna is satisfying. Let's talk about manna as sanctifying. Moses, when later reflecting on this time in the wilderness, describes it this way in Deuteronomy 8. He says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and he let you hunger and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What God is doing in that moment is not just filling their stomachs, he's shepherding their hearts and he's teaching them to trust him every day because the God who is worthy to be trusted for bread is worthy to be obeyed. 
I love the way Charles Spurgeon describes this scene of manna. I'll have it up on the screen for us and I'll read it to you. It said, God desired then to teach them himself by the gift of manna. And he taught them first his care over them, that he was their God and they were his people and he would lay himself out to provide for them. Think of the care that God had over them, over each one of them. For each man had his own portion of manna. No woman or child was forgotten. Every morning there was sufficient quantity for every man according to his needs for that day. There was no more and there was never any less. So carefully did God watch over each individual. The individuality of the divine love is a great part of the sweetness of it. God thinks of every separate child of his as much if he had only had that one. The multiplicity of his elect does not divide the loaf of his affection. He has an infinite affection for each one and he will take care of the details of each chosen life. He will see your portion filled precisely to the ounce. He will give you all you can possibly need, but he will give you nothing that you can lay by to minister to your pride. The multiplicity of his elect does not divide the loaf of his affection. The manna for heaven was for God's people, another reminder to them of his love for them through his glorious salvation. They did nothing to earn it and they received it completely apart from their labor. They had to trust God for it and they experienced God's love for them in it. In John chapter six, after the miracle of the loaves and fish, Jesus summarized and applies this manna story to us in this way. He said, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Manna was sanctifying because at the end of the day, when all those leftover crumbs began to rot away, every person was confronted with the same question. Will you trust him for tomorrow? Because remember, the question God is asking here is not what lengths are his people willing to go to survive. Not can they survive when that times get tough. If, any, if anything humanity has demonstrated is that we're willing to go through all kinds of lengths to survive. God was testing if their hearts were inclined to follow him. This whole story is foreshadowing that in Christ, God provides salvation for his children fully, freely, finally, and forever in Christ. And for those who trust in Christ, his grace is fresh to us every morning. In the next chapter, we see again Israel facing a, a similar uh, interaction, similar tests, when they get to the place where they, they run out of water. And again, given every reason to respond in this moment in faith, they respond in fear. And they begin to revile back again when, they, when they're in a place where they don't have any water. And God responds once again, not in wrath, but in mercy. And this time, he does a little bit differently. He tells Moses, hey, I want you to take the staff and I want you to strike the rock. And I want you to strike it one time. And from the rock, I'm gonna flow water freely to provide for my children. So Moses takes the rock, or staff and he strikes the rock and from the rock, water flows freely to provide for them in that moment. God chose to strike the rock and not his children, foreshadowing the day when he would send the son to be struck once and for all for our salvation. 1 Corinthians 10 describes it this way. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So the question you might be asking is what then does this story mean for us, pastor? I'm so glad you asked that. I'm gonna move to share with you guys a story about Abraham Lincoln, and I'll just read it to you, it's beautiful. He said, there's a story about Abraham Lincoln visiting a slave auction, and upon arriving, he saw a young slave up on the block, young slave girl. He said, moved with compassion, he bid and won her. After purchasing her, Lincoln told the young disbelieving girl that she was free. In her surprise, she says, what does this mean? Lincoln replied, it means you're free. She said, does this mean I can say whatever I wanna say? He said, yes, my dear, you can say whatever you want to say. He said, does this mean I can be whatever I want to be? He said, yes, you can be whatever you want to be. She said, does this mean I can go wherever I want to go? He said, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. And tears streaming down her, this little girl's face, she said, then I will go with you. The driving belief behind the American dream is that we are in control. 
then it's up to us that we need to get all we can for us in the here and now. The problem with that is that's antithetical to the Bible that says following Jesus is about surrender, not about control. When Jesus says, follow me, implicit in that command is an understanding of his lordship. When all those people are standing around and telling Jesus they wanna follow him, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't even do what I say? The reason, ultimately, that we grumble at our lack of control is because we want Jesus to save us we don't want to follow him. And at church, I want to be faithful to beat this drum every time I'm in front of you. I firmly believe the reason why so many Christians are disappointed, frustrated, or bored is because we are more about God's gifts than God's glory. Jesus said following him means dying and denying. We die to ourselves and we deny our wants and desires because what we find on the road with him is far better. If you spend any time in the New Testament, you'll see really quickly that following Christ isn't easy. In fact, when all those people are gathering around and telling Jesus they wanna follow him, his response to them is, the birds have nests, the foxes have holes, the son of man will have nowhere to lay his head. Following me might mean we're homeless tonight. But following Christ is about surrendering our control and trusting in his provision, and that his provision is sanctifying but is ultimately satisfying. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I am grateful for the truth of your word, that wherever we find ourselves this morning, in a place of doubt, fear, worry, whatever are those cavities in our heart that we have not given over to you, and trust that you'll provide for that too. All of us have those places in our life right now that we can say, this is real estate in our life that we have not given to you, that we have not trusted, yes, you will provide for that too, and yet we're reminded this morning the individuality of your divine love towards us, that as we prayed this morning, that every person in this room sitting in that chair would know that your love is not divided amongst us, but it is infinite for each one of us. So Father, we would just sit in that this morning. And whatever we have in our life right now, that by your Spirit's power, you would allow us to lay those at your feet and trust the God who loves us will provide for this too. We ask that in Christ's name for his sake.